My own involvement in Hong Kong began after June 4th. I had just joined the government and I remember the high emotions in Singapore. When he died, all the top leaders of China and Hong Kong paid him high tribute. During my years in Hong Kong, C.Y. Leong appointed me to be a member of the Hong Kong Economic Development Commission. There were murmurs in Hong Kong. Why are we letting in the Trojan horse? <laughs> There were questions in the Singapore Parliament. Why is George working? Well, not for the enemy, <laughs> but, but for our rival. In the video, please like, share, and subscribe to Chuck Kim Ming Jia. The most important thing is to hit the bell icon. Then you won't miss our latest videos. Lee Kuan Yew found reasons to visit Hong Kong every year. <laughs> it was not a policy, but he always found reasons to come. Because I was watching him. And I came to the conclusion that he found in Hong Kong a sister city from which Singapore could learn much. And he always met the same group of people, plus a few new ones, in order to get a longitudinal view of Hong Kong. My own involvement with Hong Kong began after June 4th. I had just joined the government, and I remember the high emotions in Singapore. Of course, in Hong Kong, it was 10 times, 100 times more intense. One evening, one afternoon, before a cabinet meeting, a few ministers left the lunch for a huddle with Lee Kuan Yew to talk about what statement to issue on Tiananmen. And Lee Kuan Yew said, if we do not speak up, we will not like ourselves. But he expressed what we read about Tiananmen, not in anger, but in sorrow. The people of Hong Kong were in panic, and many wanted to leave. He thought it over deeply and decided that Singapore gained more by helping Hong Kong than by exploiting its predicament. They said, yes, we could raid in the fire and benefit from the bounty, but far wiser to help Hong Kong during this period and gain for the long term. He appointed me to be in charge of a program to grant approvals in principle for the right of abode in Hong Kong. I must have visited Hong Kong 10 times in three years and met many people. Uh, I remember Lee ka saying, can you arrange an AIP approval in principle for my ama -te? He said he looked after Victor and Richard. Uh, but please, don't require him to go to Singapore because we need him here. <laughs> and don't worry about looking after her because she's a millionaire. In those days, I could make the arrangement just like that. I remember calling on Harry, Harry, Harry Lela. The sun is here. Yes, thank you. And as I knew the Indians in Hong Kong felt particularly insecure. And he was grateful. But he made a request that for the Parsi community, there are not many in Hong Kong, please offer approval in principle to the entire tribe. And we made the arrangement. I got to know Louis Cha, Ming Bao. When I went to see him in front of his office, was the man standing before the tank in Tiananmen. He was angry, bitter and angry, and took up French citizenship. I called on him over the years. He calmed down. The mainland never gave him up. One year he said, I'm building a house on the bank of Sihu. 
they give me a plot of land and they want me to build a house and after I die, the house will be a little museum about me. I, I visit the house, separate suites for him and his wife. I told him about it when I visited Hong Kong. When he died, all the top leaders of China and Hong Kong paid him high tribute. Perhaps no author was read by as many people as Louis Cha. I wrote about it in the book to talk about Hong Kong and its relationship with China, why China will never give up Hong Kong, and why Hong Kongers who are angry with China for whatever reason will one day be reconciled again. My own involvement with Hong Kong could not have happened without my losing the 2011 elections. <laughs> I decided that night to do two things. One, to close my chapter in politics and to move on in the private sector. And secondly, in gratitude for my son being saved by a bone marrow transplant from a Taiwanese Coast Guard to visit Taiwan, which I could not as foreign minister. So I lost in May, in June, I brought in my wife to call on the Honorable Zheng Yan in Hualien, and after that to meet friends in Taipei and happily presented my son as being Taiwanese by blood, <laughs> which he biologically became. So I did not know what to do in Singapore. It was difficult because I knew everybody. It's a small place. And as trade minister and foreign minister, I helped the successful companies. Some offered me vice chairmanship, but I didn't feel good about it. So I mouthed over it. Li Kuan Yu asked me, do you need help with the MASIC and GIC? I thought, if you want to make me an offer, make me an offer. <laughs> I'm not going to ask for help. So I said, thank you. I will try my own luck. And at that critical moment, Robert Kwok, who knew me from 20 years earlier, said, why don't you join me? He was put to it by a mutual friend in Singapore. In 1989, he wanted to know the up and coming politicians in Singapore. And he invited me and my wife, as young me as a young politician and my wife to Shangri-La for dinner. I was flattered. But more than that, I thought this was the most interesting person, a statesman. And one year I told him, I said, you know, in a different situation, you would have been in politics. He did not demur. But he was trapped in a particular situation in Malaysia because being Chinese, there's only so much you can do to affect public policy. He came to Singapore, felt stifled, and hopped over to Hong Kong and never looked back. But never, never denying his Malaysian past, and always proud that he was an Ai Guo Hua Chiao, a patriotic overseas Chinese. But he could say it because he was a successful man. <laughs> I don't think most people could, could talk like that. But he gave me a lifeline. I did not do him any favor. He did not owe me anything. So I tried my luck nine years with him in Hong Kong. And after my wife's miraculous, miraculous recovery from a deadly cancer, I decided it's time to move on, which I then did, doing a scatter of small things. During my years in Hong Kong, C. Y. Leong, whom I knew from way back, appointed me to be a member of the Hong Kong Economic Development Commission and uh, get to meet old colleagues here. There were murmurs in Hong Kong. Why are we letting in the Trojan horse? <laughs> there were questions in the Singapore Parliament. Why is George working? Well, not for the enemy. <laughs> but, but for our rival. I felt I was bemused and somewhat flattered by the attention. 
But the two cities share so much in common. David Wilson, wonderful person. One day we were talking about Hong Kong and Singapore, and he said, you know, it's like the competition between Oxford and Cambridge. <laughs> Exaggerated for effect. <laughs> but really sharing a profound underlying commonality. 1819 Singapore, 1842 Hong Kong, Shanghai. We were part of an old 19th century China trade and reconnected again by a much bigger 21st century China trade. And Lee Kuan Yew was wise that this relationship as sister cities is much more valuable, much more powerful, much more enduring than any advantage we could take in Hong Kong's predicament. If you enjoy this video, we invite you to extend your support by subscribing to the Master Inside channel so that you will never miss any future videos. As a Singaporean working in Hong Kong, welcome back to Hong Kong. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, my question is you took care of the AIPs for Hong Kongers in 89, but this time in 2019, uh, where many of the Hong Kong observers were saying it is quite similar, uh, a bit of similar situation, but Singapore actually refrained of doing similar things. Instead, uh, UK and uh, some other countries actually offered live book programs and all that. And can you comment on why there's a distinct difference uh, on this time Singapore's handling mm -hmm. of uh, this situation? Thank you. The 2019 disorder and the negativism felt by Hong Kongers uh, after that were very minor compared to what happened after Tiananmen. And at that time, Singapore felt it had to show up Hong Kong. This time around, when uh, Western countries offered places to uh, Hong Kongers, the underlying motivation was very political. They were trying to make a point. And unfortunately, many young Hong Kongers or many Hong Kongers fell for it. Many will regret it, and many will come back. But uh, no, Singapore doesn't want to be part of this because it became very political. But of course, if you are talented, you're hardworking, you're always welcome in Singapore. <laughs> 中意名家分析，記得俾 like 同埋分享，支持同訂閱卓見名家。最緊要撳埋呢個鐘仔，咁就唔會錯過我哋嘅新片。